that on black pairs. Um, so we're going to have a bit of a look at some of the different techniques that we've used alongside XPS in order to extract a bit more information than it would just be. So, um, so first, we're going to focus on some of the physical structure information we can get at, and then um, Sharon can then tell us a bit more about the temperature. Uh, so, first of all, we covered this this morning, but just a quick recap. Um, obviously, this is actually a super saving due to an uh, inelastic collision between electrons and the matter. And um, we, we refer to something called the inelastic mean free part uh, when we're talking about XPS measurements, which is the distance between successive collisions of electrons and the atoms they're traveling through. But when we're taking XPS measurements, uh, we don't just see kind of a snapshot of the top. X nanometers of a sample, we do see it in the So we tend to refer to the information we get of a sample as roughly three times the inelastic mean free path. So if you think, if you're familiar with the empirical, when you see a normal distribution, um, about 68% of the information from an XPS measurement comes from the top. Uh, in the, the top section of the inelastic mean free path, and every year, you can see a little bit more. So 95% from about two times the inelastic mean free path. And then 99.7% come from green signal. Uh, so this is essentially what we think of as our information, all of us have the information that we can get. Um, but you can see looking at that, that not only are you seeing the top of the measurement, but there's also information coming from different parts of our sample at different kind of Z dimensions. And um, so it should be clear that there's maybe a little bit more that we can get. Yes, than just the um, I've got that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So, when we're talking about uh, some of the different ways we can probe the spatial work out, I'm, I'm looking at mainly four kind of techniques today. Uh, I'm scattering, I'm bombarding. Using a combination of surface and bulk techniques, so things like EDX, XLF, ICD, uh, and also using very low X ray source energy. And um, as we've already heard from David, we get it's easy in terms of the probing depth when you vary the source energy. So I'm going to focus first on iron bomb bulk, and this is kind of probably the simplest thing. Uh, in terms of experimentally, you just take an iron and strap it in the surface and it remove some matter. So if you do an XPS measurement and then smash the lines into it, remove a few layers, and then do another XPS measurement, you can start to build up a profile of what your sample looks like in different parts of uh, the surface and deeper into the surface. So, a nice sample of this is from our technical director Dave uh, from a few years ago, looking at some platinum cobalt electric catalytic oxygen induction. Um, and they did a couple of different synthetic treatments. And it's a depth profile to look at what the, how the surface was behaving after these different treatments. And essentially, what they saw was that after flame energy, you get a more reduced cobalt system, whereas uh, without flame energy, you have this thick oxidic layer. A depth profile of the uh, non flame energy, which was important. So that these, uh, these thick oxidic layers were roughly 10 millimeters at minimum, which was. Very much influencing the reaction and the OR reaction. And you can see the bottom two parts there are the very nice parts of platinum and cobalt and oxygen issues. Uh, so, I won't touch too much on this, this is a fairly self explanatory technique. Um, but one other thing to mention is that typically this has been done in the past, been using monochrom uh, monatomic uh, ions. Now, uh, these can be these can be quite tough, particularly if you've got soft materials like polymers or organic. You can do, you can do chemical changes with the chemistry with the monatomic. So, in more recent years, there's been a development in terms of using gas clusters instead of monatomic um, ions. So, typically, you would use iron and clusters um, somewhere between 500 and 300, uh, 3,000 atoms uh, at various. Um, Accelerating voltages, so you can kind of tune how uh, damaging or how soft the, the arm bombardment is, and this is this allows you to do much better depth profiling, so sensitive materials, and also make sure that you're not doing any kind of 
she heal happens to be one that very good as well. That's that profiling uh, very quick was sort of, and so the next thing I want to cover is I'm scattering spectrus in which uh, you might be less me. Uh, this is a technique in which um, you take an iron and scatter it up the surface and you measure the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is related to the mass of the scattering on the surface. Uh, so the equations down there, which you can follow, but essentially you get a spectrum of um, peaks of different energies and you can calculate what atom that peak represents. Um, and do some varying degrees of quantitative analysis. And you need quite good reference materials to do true quantitative analysis of this. It's very good for quantitative analysis. Uh, and so, provided you've got the materials, um, you can do quantitative analysis. So, we typically would use helium ions at quite low frequencies because this is essentially a, another bombardment. So we don't want to damage our surface. Uh, so helium ions are low energies and also um, we would tend to arrest the sky. So uh, take a two mil or three mil area and that's the living across it to minimize the damage to the sky. But um, one thing that is can be quite nice and quite useful about a uh, this technique and the fact that we don't slightly damage the surface is you can build up depth levels. You scan for a long time off that. You can see how that changes as you slowly grow through it. Um, and it's very complementary to iron salt, which I'm not going to cover today. There's a very nice paper where they uh, did angles of XPS and depth profiling with um, ISS, uh, which is in a review that we did last year or the year before. Um, but they wanted 30 pounds for the English for a presentation, so I'm not showing it there. But if you want to think about that, then I'll run into it. Um, but in terms of this analysis, what you can do is a bit of methodological information. Um, so if you've got structural changes, if you combine that with things like uh, high temperature gas for that processing, you can see since you will just look at the and look at the changes in terms of the uh, surface coverage. Of the this is a very nice example. I really like this example from um, Scott Hansen, the University of Utah. Um, this is looking at combining uh, TPD and ISS. What I really like about this is that they um, kind of covers all of the things that you need to think about with ISS. So they've got some cleaning things and they're using ISS to determine where the uh, CO is absorbed, absorbing um, and using that to kind of inform what peaks are what on their TPD. Um, so they took a cladding on setting that is ETR and did ISS at different uh, temperatures. Um, but what you can see from the dotted lines here when you've got um, calibrated PD removal rate and calibrated PD recovery rate is that when, when you do the ISS you're going to be removing CO from so for, for these have got sort of CO on them. Um, when you in iron scattering, you're going to be removing CO and you're also going to be removing some palladium by action. So they've got some reference materials they've calibrated for the action, they've calibrated the CO removal, and they've factored that into the, um, the, their kind of measurements here. And uh, essentially, what they were able to determine based on the um, different temperature gradients uh, is that uh, the low temperature desorptions in their TPDs were from uh, peripheral absorptions around the um, the kind of interfaces of the palladium and titanium. And it went to the topic of higher temperatures, you started to see the removal of the CO from the top of the palladium catalysts, uh, which are going to be the ones blocking the, the iron scattering signal from uh, palladium. This is just a nice example. Yeah. And so I'm just not very carefully about it. So. And another really nice example from um, Charles Campbell, who was in Washington, is uh, showcasing how these can be used to determine growth. So uh, again, if you date for how proper CA catalysts are very um, widely used for lots of different engines. And so modeling how these kind of grow um, is very easy to be designed on optimum catalysts. And uh, so this was done in a big metal deposition on a cerium uh, overlay of Roman in one one film. And by doing iron scattering at uh, different copper coverages. They were able to determine the growth rate. So, there's some theoretical 
lines on the top block where you can see if there was a layer by layer group, we can kind of see a, a linear shape straight from um, zero coverage to, to one monolayer coverage. Whereas if you start forming islands, uh, you you get these kind of more drawn out curves, which you can see that the, the material grown follow the um, what they call a hemispherical cap maybe, rather than a, a layer by layer growth. Um, so it's just um, yeah, a nice example of how you can use model material growth. Uh, you might have picked up on the it's so far to learn single question flat surfaces. Um, it is possible to do this in practice. It's not as easy. You generally get about four single. Um, but with the right preparation techniques, it is possible. So this is an example of something we did recently and looking at some monolayer growth titanium something SBA 15, um, which is obviously quite well known as a support. Uh, typically these are synthesized with a lot of excess um, of Metal out of oxide, these are quite expensive. Um, uh, yeah. If you, you can minimize it, then that's good. Um, and we've seen that actually, once you grow to a theoretical monolayer based on the hydroxyl density of the you, you, you don't actually see any problems just in the iron sketch. Um, so the, this, this could be a really lot of nice. <clears throat> and another nice example is from um, some summer students I had uh, was looking at. How these uh, in a similar system to zirconium, there was some zirconium phosphate films grow on SBA and be eventually came to uh, growing them on luminous surface. So these uh, are definitely super acidic. Um, again, we saw something similar with the growth of the zirconium, which potentially kept, um, our surface coverage a little bit lower than the titanium. And we're also looking at uh, growing a uh, one part method of zirconium phosphate on the surface and seeing if we get phosphate linkages between um, between zirconium sites and getting a, a, a more complete surface coverage of our material, or whether we grow the phosphate to the zirconium. Um, and what we can see from the bottom block is that our silicon content on the surface remains unchanged no matter what the phosphorus to the zirconium ratio. Um, so all of our phosphate groups are Sitting on top of the zirconium, um, and we're not increasing our overall surface. So, these are these uh, to be quite good candidates for a fructose solution at convergence. <coughs> so, I'm going to move on now from my discussion to some very good extra source energies. Uh, we've covered a the theory about this. Uh, essentially, if you choose the extra source energy, you can choose, choose the, um, the probing depth. So we would typically go to higher extra source energies, increase the probing depth um, with uh, the higher inelastic medium of the energy electrons. Um, again, very quick because days when we mentioned this, but the one thing you have to be careful of is when you use higher energy sources, you get increased uh, cross sections. Um, so generally the signal will be quite lower and unless you use specialist so the little bit of gallium sources where you can use much higher fluxes uh, to look on the that. Um, but I'm going to focus on the application of it into a, um, a group of practice that um, I've been working on with a lot of other people recently, um, which is spatial segregated catalysts. So when you've got a difference in kind of Z position of two distinct catalytic sites, so, for example, in hierarchical pore structures or in pore shell materials, uh, actually, this is a unique position to help determine where each catalyst site is. Um, and then these catalysts are going to be very good at just using, utilizing different systems of transport. Um, so, for example, through different pore models, direct uh, reaction flow when you do multi step reactions. So, a very simple example of a kind of multi functional catalyst in different spatial domains. Is a core shell now. Uh, and in this example, here we've got some uh, magnetic cores surrounded by a deep shell. So, ease of separation of catalysts. Um, and it uh, just showcases a very simple model of um, where you've got different catalyst sites in different spatial domains. One thing to look at when you're looking at core shells and, uh, and any kind of X case analysis of overheads or nanoscales. 
uh, is differences in the electron path length depending on the shape of the material. So Alex Shard at NPL has done a lot of work developing top packs and different ways to compensate for different shapes. Um, so this is something you can't do. Just make sure to read everything that Alex Shard publishes because he's covered it in absolute detail. Um, and yeah, you can find solutions to long term ground field and some of his work. Um, so when, when you're calculating over so this is an example of using uh, zirconium sulfate and zirconium catalysts, when you're calculating over there, one thing that is important is using a kind of I zero structure. So in this case, a blank silica is used, and then as we increase the number of monolayers of, um, of our catalysts that come to the surface, we're going to be attenuating more and more of that silica signal. And we can just use the simple attenuation relationship to, um, to just calculate how many monolayers are attenuating that signal. And as you can see up there, you can um, draw a plot and you can calculate. It's quite simple, uh, quite easy from your decreased FP intensity and the uh, nanometers of monolayer you have. One, so often we can develop in nanoparticles, catalysts. Um, one thing that can be quite difficult is separating metal nanoparticles. So a lot of solution-based synthesis methods will come with things like capping agent um, and getting a, a kind of I zero structure of something which is very difficult to separate and it's going to be in a liquid is going to be very difficult there to get those. I think we've probably covered already that. Uh, so one way that we've found around this in the past is to use different X-ray sources to kind of um, remove the need for an I zero. So here we use aluminium and magnesium sprays um, to calculate the shell thickness of some silver silicon based and now You can see from the top plot these uh, calculations agree very nicely with some correction across the measurements. Um, so I won't go into too much detail here, but essentially it just works on simultaneous equations. You can your I zero should be both your inelastic mean impact is going to depend on the X-ray excitation energy. So, since these equations together, and you can calculate your D, which you should have. Um, but it's just a nice example. Getting over one of the problems with calculation is well, more tricky to it. Uh, so, another example of material when you might have some, uh, some fairly material and some uh, more surface relevant material is uh, some spatial or carbon catalysts. Um, so, the first system we're going to look at. We have the RF pore structure where we've got some macro pores, mesa pores. In the macro pores, there are some sulfates, some carrier monolayers. And then in the mesa pores, we've got some buried MGO nanoparticles. And actually, we're going to do a lot of uh, electron microscopy things to kind of look at our domains. But it's a 2D image. Some of these materials are quite complicated. If you want to look at them in real detail, then you need to do something like tomography, which is incredible at the time you see. Uh, and, then, and even then, you're only looking at a small sample of your, a small segment of your sample. So, if we want to do something with a slightly more bulk um, appreciation, um, and by the bulk, I mean looking at lots of different um, particles within your sample, then the NXPS can certainly help um, resolve some of the. Uh, Results of the information. So, in this system where we've got buried MGO, uh, we used silver X rays. So, this is about uh, double the energy of uh, an aluminium X ray source. And by comparing the magnesium to silicon ratio with our silver X ray anode and our aluminium X ray anode, we can see that when we start to get deeper into our structure, we see a lot more magnesium relative to silicon. Without how um, many anode, uh, most of it's too varied to see. Uh, another really nice example of these kind of systems is a um, metal nanoparticle and zeolites uh, system where we've got a music voice uh, zeolites with some buried metal particles inside. Uh, and the introduction of the segregated metal and zeolite system and massively which is the productivity here for uh, lower acid stone again. And why I really like this example, um, so this is using a liquid going hard x-ray source from Manchester. 
um, they've combined uh, so HPS from us, taxpayers from Manchester, and some ICP to kind of give three levels of depth information into their sample. So when we go right down to the bulk, the ICP can see that whether you've got new support or not, or the CLS, the overall amount of metal in the system is pretty much constant. Uh, even by hackers, um, there is a huge amount of difference um, in the uh, actually, so the one on the right side is non means of course, and um, zero. Once we start to introduce the means of course, we can see a lot more of the metal on uh, the surface because they're uh, pre formed as a metal particle, so they sit in the means of course channels rather than being drawn into the microcore system of the zero. Um, and hackers, actually, as an ICP. Give you the experiment, those three depths in the sample to help you kind of visualize where the metal is sitting in the system. Uh, so, a, a quick mention to surface to bulk analysis. This is kind of a, um, a bit more of a qualitative technique, but it can be useful nonetheless. Uh, when looking at nanoparticle systems, which is quite common in the analysis. Uh, you can get some nice quality of information from different plot ratios depending on whether you've got linear particle size or a uh, changing particle size. Um, and the thing you see quite a lot is if you've got a uh, constant particle size, you see a linear trend in surface to plot because it's not really much changing in terms of um, where, how the signal of the nanoparticle is reaching the surface, whether you've got changing particle size. You get differences in terms of um, the attenuation through within the same nanoparticle, and so you tend to see this field changing particle size. It's just a quality tool, which is quite nice if you're uh, looking for an, a, a bulk technique rather than relying on um, electron microscopy. Uh, so, referring back to search bulk analysis. This is probably not something that's going to come up too much for a lot of vitality um, But if you're working on things like monoliths, where uh, you know, like, um, a big industrial system and the kind of spatial arrangement for your cameras might be quite important, XPS imaging can give you information on the, uh, the X and Y, um, the X and Y positions of your different elements in your chemical states. Uh, and then if you combine this with EDX, which is something that we are looking to hopefully bring to Harlex just soon and um, into our thermo system. And uh, you can combine that with EDX mapping, which is a bulk technique, and then you can compare your your elemental um, your elemental maps essentially with your so with the bulk with your surface elemental maps from XPS. And so it just gives you that extra level of information and special information on that on a wide level but the resolution of these is kind of limited by the xps we typically looking at maybe about 10 15 microns um spatial resolution to say for a lot of power this might not necessarily be the best system but certainly for, for larger systems um the, this is a really nice uh, nice combination so um finally i'm just going to mention Something which has been brought up already today, um, and that's inelastic background monitoring. So, as Bill said, um, as you increase your speed spectrum, the, um, the background increases, and this is due to the spectrum effects from the kind of buried uh, electrons within the system. But you don't just see background from the kind of core electron, you see atoms which are buried well. Um, below our information that can still contribute to the background. And so there is some information you can get from electrons which are very even in the uh, So this is this was developed by a uh, state two guys who's done an awful lot of work on um, different backgrounds and realistic backgrounds. You're probably familiar with the Shirley background, um, which we definitely recommend you use. It's, it's very um, with background to you, but it doesn't really have any basis in reality. Sends to the uh, uh, sends to the background models the photo emission process uh, on a theoretical level and gives you a much more accurate description of the background. Uh, but the reason we wouldn't recommend anyone using it uh, is because you 
need to really, really know I mean, you need to really, really know kind of what you're doing in terms of a budget. So it's not a simple thing to just kind of write to any answer. Um, but it can be very useful in terms of reviewing a lot of information about every structures. So this is these are different pictures at the graph from the website. The kind of differences in spatial arrangement of um, your your structures, your various structures gives you different backgrounds. So for example, if you look at the proper structure down there, whether we've got buried structures or whether we've got overlays, you can see a massive difference too. And then spends really, really nice piece of software called Quasis Tuba, which kind of enables you to get lots of really nice quantitative information about this. I'm not going to go into a detail about this. If you go to that website, um, spends a load of brilliant videos. Uh, he often does a lot of work to really explain it. Um, and there's no point in it because you can, <laughs> you can hear it from the man himself. Um, this works particularly well in combination because you get deeper into your sample, you get more information um, from, from within your structures. So I'm just going to finish up on feedback for that. It's some from different people. And um, the, the, some of the spatial um, stuff is the Z axis. Uh, Shenji Ding from the University of Manchester, working with Chris Pollock and uh, Yaya Pan. Ben Spencer's the um, actress, the um, he runs actress in Manchester. He's affiliated to Harvard XPS as well. Um, if you're interested in doing any actress, you can find his contact information on our website. Um, so get in touch, very nice guy. You more than have to talk to his university. Um, Cameron's been helping me with some of the internet projects with my students uh, at UCL. They're in the middle. From the summer and um, Karen and my team uh, did a lot of the other special work with me in the uh, previous preparation. So, thank you very much for listening to us. Uh, any questions to Mark? Your iron scatter? Yes. Do you see any charging effects? Uh, that's a great question. And, uh, so yes, we do. So we typically run the blood guns for those, and um, because if you run the lack of blood guns, you get nonsense. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we do, but uh, this is work very nicely. Any other questions? Actually, if you think of one, um, I'll back Mark outside of this. Um, uh, when Workshop webinar. I'm so negative. Um, oh, sorry, so you're asking in the chat. Uh, oh, I see somebody's just said yes. What is the depth limitation of low energy ion spectrum compared to XPS? Uh, so you're, you're literally looking at that's not fair of atoms. So um, obviously, if you. If, if you don't have a perfectly uniform system, then you're going to look at some kind of mixture of um, what overlays are there and what structures are coming on. So the base, the top layer of atoms. Um, yeah, if you start to increase the energy, because we're working very low energy, if you increase the energy, you'll start to throw more um, layers underneath. So it's similar to a technically you might be familiar with Rutherford back to so be um, itch, whatever it's based on, which to give you a few more layers. But a low energy system, that one um, layer. And um, Cameron's asking, um, could you expand a bit on U2 and U3 to guards and how you can go about getting better at using them over Shirley? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the best thing you can do is go onto YouTube and find Neil Fairley's videos on Icasa. Uh, Neil Fairley? Neil, well, it's just Icasa, yes. Okay. Um, YouTube channel because Neil goes through exactly what all the different um, parameters are needed and how to use them. Explaining them, that was a bit more advanced. So, <laughs> yeah, YouTube Cassidy. Hopefully, that answers the question on the YouTube from where to start. 